In this message, unlike those before me, I don't have five points. I don't have every heading starting with the same letter. But for those who do take notes, there are four parts, okay? The true vine, the vine dresser, the branches, the fruit. Those are the four parts. The true vine. In the Old Testament, the metaphor of both vine and vineyard is used quite often to describe Israel. Israel knew that they were the vine God had planted. In Psalm 80, verses 8 to 9, it says this, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and it filled the land. However, it didn't always go the way God planned, and it didn't always end up with the right intended results. Isaiah verse 5, 7 says this, Israel is the vineyard of the Lord God Almighty. The people of Judah are the vines he planted. He expected them to do what was good, but instead they committed murder. He expected them to do what was right, but their victims cry out for justice. Jeremiah 2.21, I planted you like a choice vine from the very best seed. But look what you have become. You're like a rotten, worthless vine. So when Jesus said in John 51, I am the true vine, the disciples understood the metaphor and that he is also the true Israel. Jesus is the obedient shoot. He embodied all God had called Israel to be. The planting of the Lord, so the Father is glorified. So by stating he is a true vine, that indicates by the default, doesn't it, there are false vines. Did you know that even before Jesus arrived on earth, and even after he left, there were many people crying out, proclaiming that they were the Savior, that they were the Messiah. And some had the audacity to say they were God Almighty himself. Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, 23, 24. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's a Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So take note. I probably spend more time than I should on YouTube, mainly because I hardly watch any TV. And uh, because I find it a source of easy information, entertainment, news, views, etc. However, whatever we watch or we listen to, we need to be continually discerning. There are many voices going out in this world. I've come across lately what I call Christian opinionators. They seem to be a judge and an expert in everything. Be aware of what I call Christian horoscopes, although we know that's an anomaly. No such thing exists. But every now and you see these little posts that go, God is going to bring someone your way to tell you this. Or you have a picture of a blue-eyed Jesus. You can skip this if you don't love me. Or another post, my child, something good will happen in the next three days. It does sound like a horoscope, doesn't it? Don't click on them. Don't entertain yourself. Ignore them. God doesn't work that way. You want information? Go to the Word. Pray. Be discerning. Matthew 5, 7, 15. Be aware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We can tell dark from light, but sometimes the worst part of the day is the dawn and the dusk because the light is not so clear. You know? And there are people who do come in sheep's clothing. We need to be very careful to what we watch and listen to. So how do you discern truth and error? Simply by staying connected to the true vine. The vine dresser. John 1.1. 1, 1. My father is the vine dresser. Jesus knew as a true vine, he was in good hands. He was in safe family hands. The primary role of a father is to protect, provide, and discipline. And as in the case of a good vine dresser, to care for the health of the vine by protecting it from disease, provide good nutrients from the soil, and prune to cut back so better fruit 
will result. Leading to my third part of this message later on, as a branch, you are connected to the vine. You are in good hands. Not only does a father know what he's doing, he's been doing it for a very long time. He loves you, and therefore he prunes you. He disciplines you, because he doesn't want good and better to rob you of the best in your life. As most of us know, a tree has a trunk. It's supported by roots. However, I didn't really know this until I Googled it, you know. A vine is a plant whose stems require support. Some time ago, I was up north in Kirikiri, and I stayed at at an Airbnb that I normally do stay. And it was dusk towards the end of the day. and, um, And where I parked my car, there are these posts and beams and a grapevine. And because I knew I'll be talking in John 15, I paid extra attention. But this grapevine was overgrown. You know, there was leaves everywhere, and I had to push my car to get out of the, you know, the door because the leaves were everywhere. And I was thinking, where does it start and where does it stop? And so I kind of trailed it, you know, from the garage to the unit I'm staying, to the walkway, to the house. And this vine went all the way down. It was just intertwined, all wrapped around along there, somewhere along there, and then back along there and towards the unit. It just went on forever. And then finally, I found the roots. You know, but I thought, wow, what an amazing plant. It's just the, the vines are everywhere. And, um, and I guess the point of all this is that I couldn't believe the reach it had from its roots all the way to around the house. The longest grapevine in the world is known as the grapevine at Hampton Court Palace near London. It is 250 years old, and the longest rod is 36.5 meters, or those of you who are old school, 120 feet. So what does that mean? So if from where I'm standing, all the way out to the very front door by the front steps, that's how long its rod is, its reach. That's amazing, that's just one rod. Why do I share that? Because did you know as a Christian, you have reach. Wherever God has planted you, wherever God, and however God has made you, you have reach. You have influence in the world that you live in. You know? So in your job, in your occupation, as a neighbor, as a friend, you have great reach. Never underestimate what God has put in you. Sadly, there's also a downside to this message. John 15, 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Some time ago, while I was queuing up for lunch at a cafe, I came across a young lady who had been involved with Alpha, and she was on fire for the Lord. She was one of the helpers, possibly a host, and she was just loving and living the Christian life. And, uh, but it's been ages since we last met, and uh, so when I saw her, we are going to, you know, just small talk. And then later on, I said to her, oh, by the way, which fellowship are you going to now? There was silence. She said, nowhere. I sensed she wasn't looking for one either. And I didn't feel that in this environment at the cafe, I should probe the conversation further. But I couldn't help but feel, like so many others, she had compromised her faith and was now drifting, breaking away from what she once clung to. I know in Hebrews 13 verse five it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. John 10, 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Although I believe God benevolently loves us and fiercely fights for us, if you decide and deliberately make the choice to no longer remain in the Lord, and you decide deliberately to walk away, 
The love of God has got to let you go. Because God doesn't hold us back against our will. He'll fight for us fiercely. But if many choose to leave his hands, he may have to let you go. But I hope you come back. There's always room for the prodigal. I mentioned a vine is a plant whose stems require support. Jesus drew his support from the Father in John 14, verse 20. You guys can read about it later. Jesus says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So likewise, we draw support from the vine Jesus. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. In John 15, verses 4 to 11, did you know the word abide appears 10 times? I don't think it's a word that we use often in everyday conversation. When did someone last say to you, come, let us abide together for afternoon tea? You don't, do you? So what does abide mean? Simply to dwell, to remain, to be held to be kept. Basically, stay connected. Stay connected. Remember the grapevine I mentioned earlier at the AMB? You know how the vines just seem to wrap itself around the beams and into each other and just goes on forever. In preparing this message, I began to feel quite strongly that what I'm about to share is the core part of this morning's message. About 30 years ago, our family and many others were involved to help plant a church in a small suburb we lived in. Like so many others aspiring to be a new church, we built our basis on Acts 2.42, which goes, as they, the apostles, devoted themselves, to, sorry, as the disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all who believed were together and all had things in common. So we met together, we shared together, we broke bread, we prayed, we were a good fellowship. There were maybe about six to ten families who were pretty consistent, and we were reasonably well connected. Sometime later, I was made aware of an older couple who had been coming over the few weeks who were facing hard times, so much so that they had to sell their dining table to pay for the bills. I don't remember. If we took an offering to help, I would like to think going back we did. And I'm not sure how much more we did more than that. Because if you want to live by X242, you also need X45. And what does that say? They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. What would have happened if all of us in that group had made a greater financial support to the couple who was hurting? I wonder how that would have changed the circumstances. Some time ago, we were part of a cell group, connect group, they met together for many, many years in the host couple's home. They wanted to renovate the kitchen and it was going to take roughly about six weeks. They had a gas cooker downstairs, so we knew that they could feed themselves. I don't recall any of us in the group inviting them over for dinner or to take them out during that time. And I guess I feel the way I feel because it shouldn't be like that, should it? It wasn't because we didn't like them or didn't care. They're friends, they're church family. It was, just a, it was just that we were so wrapped up in other things. Life gets in the way. Church, I believe, is imperative as we grow, especially this size, that we truly look out for one another. If someone is in hospital or care, 
and Wood Valley visitors, let's have a visiting team. If a baby is born, let us be aware of it so we can bring the parents a meal or two or more. If someone here through unfortunate circumstances end up homeless, will there be room in the inn or the manger? It's not enough to come here once a week. It's not enough to hear a message. It's not enough to have refreshments and fellowship. That's not church. And we should never be too embarrassed to ask for help if we need help. We don't have to like each other, but we do need to care for each other. If we can't do what we're small, it won't happen what we're big. True? Yes, yes. The fruit. Some say the fruit is love in reference to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, and so on. In John 15, verse 12, it says this. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Romans 12, 10. Love one another warmly as Christians. Galatians 5, 13. Through love, serve one another. Paul helped to put this into perspective in 2 Corinthians 8. I'm not trying to relieve others by putting a burden on you, but since you have plenty at this time, it is only fair that you should help those who are in need. Then when you are in need and they have plenty, they in turn will help you. Galatians 16. So then, as often as we have the chance, we should do good to everyone, and especially to those who belong to our family in the faith. So going back to what I just shared previously, will it at times be inconvenient? Yes. Will it be challenging? Yes. Will it be a commitment? Yes. Right answer. It's important to know what Paul wrote in Corinthians chapter 13, and we all know it. We don't do things out of guilt or obligation, things like that. The motivation has to be love. Love for God, love for our fellow being, love for one another. Love is different from like. I don't have to like you, I do have to love you, if that makes sense. Not out of duty, love. In fact, all this should be a natural consequences or flow simply by abiding in Jesus. John 15, 5, those who abide in me, remain in me, and I in him will bear much fruit. So while some commentaries say the fruit is Galatians, other people say that the fruit is actually the result. So let's look at that situation. Our lives should show the result of staying connected to God, deeply rooted in him, growing in godly character because of him, exercising faith and walking in obedience with him. To have such an abiding relationship that Jesus says in John 15, 7, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. This is a holy calling. In verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. In closing, I always like to put that down in closing because then you know it's going to happen, isn't it? (laughs) In closing. So for the next half an hour... In closing, God did not call us to produce more vines, but rather fruit. Because it's by our fruit that people will know what sort of vine we are. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have a love for one another. Matthew 14 says this, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others 
so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Therefore, be good grapes that the Father may be glorified in our lives. Be the most mouth-watering, delicious, desirable grape fruit you can ever be. I was going to pray in closing, but if I read Philippians chapter 1, God has the last word. Philippians 1, 6, then 9 to 11. And I think this summarizes everything. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, through the glory and praise of God. Amen. You.